Have you ever found yourself asked to speak on the spot at a business meeting, giving feedback or at a wedding? How did you feel? Did your palms start to sweat? Did your throat grow dry? <clears throat> as mine is now. Uh, these moments are meaningful. And today we'll learn as humans, as humans, we are ill-equipped to show up just when we need to the most. Today you'll learn there is a better way to effectively get your message out when put on the spot. Welcome to Meet the Author Live. I'm your host, John Saunders, founder of Forward Advisory Solutions, a coaching and consultancy firm, and our author of The Optimizer, building and leading a team of serial innovators. My firm was built on the foundation of over 20 years as an executive distribution leader on Wall Street. This show offers you thought leadership wisdom through live conversations with the ability to get your questions answered in real time. <clears throat> to start, please drop in the chat where you're joining us from. It's always great to see where our listeners are coming in from to get a sense of the audience. And so we know how to use the chat function because after our formal questions, we're gonna open it up the floor to let you all put questions and comments in the chat as well. Today, I'm glad to welcome communication expert and second time author, Matt Abrams, who will help us do a better job of building the skills needed for effective, spontaneous speaking. He just published his new second, his new best-selling book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, How to Speak Successfully When You're Put in the Spot. In Matt's work and book, you'll learn solutions to this daily challenge of being put on the spot and how to convert the awkwardness of spontaneous speaking into a superpower. A little bit about Matt. He's a lecturer in organizational behavior at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. He teaches popular classes in strategic communication and effective virtual presenting, public speaking, and improv. He's a leading expert in the field of communication and an award-winning teacher at Stanford University. When he's not teaching, Matt is a highly sought after keynote speaker and communications consultant and coach. He's worked with Apple, Google, Facebook, PwC, and many more. He's helped numerous presenters prepare for high stakes talks like IPO roadshows, Nobel Prize award presentations, appearances at TED and the World Economic Forum. His online talks garner millions of views and he hosts the popular award-winning podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart at Stanford University. Matt loves time with his family, the outdoors and talking sports, and he's no stranger to the karate dojo. Matt, it's great to see you. Welcome to the show. Thanks, John. I'm excited to be here. So fun. I want to take a quick gander here, just where we're getting some folks calling in from. I mean, it looks like a, a pretty global audience here right out of the gate. Um, and I also want to say a special thanks uh, to Deep Pawa, who first introduced me to the Stanford community a little while ago. And of course, uh, Petya, who introduced the two of us uh, just a few uh, weeks ago. So really wanted to say thanks to both of those ladies. Uh, for the introductions. So let's dive into the questions. But as I read through your book, I so appreciate the perspectives you share to help us reframe spontaneous communication. And as I read the book, I found myself thinking of these lessons you shared often the opposite of what comes naturally. And I bet others might feel the same. So I, I want to dive into that. But before we go there, I'm curious how karate became part of your life. Where did that come from? <laughs> So I've been studying martial arts for four decades, and thanks for wow. asking about it. It's something I haven't really talked much about. Um, I had a cousin, I have a cousin, who uh, has always been a bit of an inspiration for me. He's a, a slightly older than me, and he uh, he had done martial arts, and I found it fascinating to see what he was able to do. Um, and it really, really was intriguing to me. And at the time, you know, I, I started when I was in middle school. There was um, a, a, just a need, a lot of energy and a need to find an outlet for it. And, and uh, uh, while I love sports, I'm not great at most team sports. And the martial arts was a, a nice home for me. That is really cool. So many interesting lessons there for sure. And what about education? How did you find yourself in a career in education? You've been at that for quite some time now as well. Well, actually, the first experience I ever had teaching was teaching the martial arts. So oh, wow. in my late uh, high school career, I, I had achieved a rank high enough to begin teaching. And I found it, that it was something that I really enjoyed. My mother is a, is a school teacher, was a school teacher. She also taught English as a second language. So I come from a family of teachers. So it's something that I've always enjoyed. And fundamentally, I'm just very curious. And so education is a great way to sort of scratch that itch and I, I went all through not only undergraduate, but graduate school, loved studying what I studied, loved trying to find ways to apply it, needed to pay off some loans. So I went and worked in the corporate world for about 10 years doing work in high tech and then returned back to my passion. I actually started by teaching high school and slowly graduated. I went from teaching high school for a couple of years to teaching at a community college for over a decade. And now I'm at a graduate school. So I, I think I've run out of places to teach uh, and, and I enjoy every level and, and enjoy uh, learning and helping others to learn skills. That is incredible. What a journey. And I love the sort of legacy you're carrying on for your family there. That's really beautiful. And, and this curiosity, which I think 
I found throughout the book as I read, there's such a, a, a key thread and theme in there. But what, another thing I was curious about is, you know, where did this whole concept come from? You know, what really drove you to, to write this book, Matt? So there are actually two, two origins for this book. One is my very personal story. With the last name of Abrahams, I have always been speaking first. So this was something that was just the way it happened. You know, in, in my schooling, uh, I always sat front row towards the door. I knew where my seat was in every class. And most teachers would always start alphabetically. So I was always in, uh, on the spot to speak in the moment. So this was something that for me was very personal. About nine years ago uh, at the business school at Stanford, the deans came to me and said, we have a problem. And the problem is this, our amazingly bright students who know the answers to these questions are freezing up when the professor points at them and says, what do you think? The dreaded cold call. And they <laughs> asked me if there were things I could do to help our students feel more comfortable and confident. So I jumped right in. I looked at research from many, many fields, psychology, anthropology, sociology, neuroscience, and as well as improvisation and acting. And as a result, created a six-step methodology that we've been teaching to our students for almost a decade now. And every Stanford MBA student within the first three weeks of their time on campus has the opportunity to take this material. And what we hear from the students as well as the professors is the students feel more comfortable in the professor get. And as a result of developing the methodology, I then began using it in my consulting practice, teaching it in other ways, and people all over the world benefit from it. And so the genesis of the book was to really capture those ideas and help spread it around even farther. That is incredible. So your own journey being uh, at the top of the alphabet and then working with the students uh, uh, and seeing challenges at, at Stanford University, which is fascinating to me. You know, why is, why is spontaneous speaking so hard for all of us? What makes it such a challenge, would you say? Well, I think it's challenging for many, for many reasons. One, uh, in the moment, we feel we have to respond and we have to do really well. We feel the intense anxiety of being put on that, in that spot and having to do that responding. And it, I think, in all of us to really want to be seen as somebody who contributed in a meaningful way in that crucible that happens when somebody asks you for feedback or asks you yourself, or even if you're just making small talk, can really feel uh, pressure build in their canoe. And, and this is the counter is that the, the most important one is that we can all get better at. Many of us feel like you're just born with the gift of gab. I have it or I, in fact, you can develop to be a much more competent human being. Incredible. And, you know, it's interesting that sometimes we think if we're just born with it right and it's just this natural gift we have. But in fact, it takes an inordinate amount of training and practice, if you've as you've certainly shared uh, throughout the book and the stories that you uh, talk through, which is really good lesson for all of us, right? To know that when we see those folks talking on the TED Talk stage, as you talked about in your book, and then we sort of start to compare ourselves to that person and think, well, wait a minute, that person spent months preparing that and it has a scripted speech, right? And, and this whole thing. Uh, but when you think about that sort of pressure and anxiety uh, that we feel when we're put in the spot and we want to sound intelligent, you know, what is it? What do you see as the big mistake or the most common mistake we see in that in that situation? Yeah, this thing I think gets in the way of this desire to do it right. We feel this intense pressure to say the right thing, and and I'm here, John. I'm doing this for a long, long time. There is no right way to communicate. There are better ways and worse ways, but there is one. Way and put that pressure on ourselves actually it's less likely that it boils down to cognitive load. And if you think of your brain as, as a computer, it's not a perfect analogy, but if I am constantly evaluating what I'm saying while I'm saying it, it actually gets in the way of me saying, it. just like when you on your laptop, on your phone, have lots of apps or windows open, it performs. So if we can turn that volume down. I actually heard somebody uh, share that I love it. If we can clear the just a little bit, we can communicate better. The goal is not perfection. And when we not a value that moment, act better. So I have the audacity to start my 
MBA class, my strategic communication class, on the very first day, I tell my students that the goal is to maximize mediocrity. And you should see their jaws drop. They're like, what? Nobody in my life has ever told me to do that. So what do we do? We actually have to turn that volume down of, of our evaluation and we Matt? Yes. Have oh, I frozen? Oh, we you froze up there for a second. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Maybe there's a little hiccup with the Wi-Fi or something here today, but uh, hopefully you ever saw a couple notes on that in the chat as well, but uh, want to try one more time? Yes. And I'm sorry about oh. that. I don't know what's going on. Um, oh. So essentially the goal, the, the goal are pressure that we put on ourselves and to focus on connection, not perfection. It reduces our cognitive load. So, so important. And that's, that gets back to one of these paradoxes that I was referencing earlier. When you talk about maximize mediocrity, who would ever think to do that, right? Why, why am I going to focus on being mediocre or bad, uh, <laughs> uh, which is not a great thing. Uh, you know, another big theme that you talk about is this idea of structure. And having led a, a, a team of sales folks on Wall Street for many years, I ran into this issue a lot, which was, well, I don't need structure and scripts. I'm really good at sort of operating on my feet and this kind of thing. And so I wonder, um, you know, you really stressed the line you used was when you're speaking spontaneously, having a roadmap doesn't bog you down. It frees you up. Matt, how do constraints create freedom? Yeah. So I, as I mentioned, there are lots of counterintuitive ideas in the book. And one of them is this notion of structure actually sets you free. The constraints you put on actually give you some freedom. So if we think about this, this is not a novel idea. If you play a sport, for example, you know that you take time to actually train and drill. You know if you're a jazz musician that you play some specific chords uh, and chord progressions. Uh, I interviewed somebody who's a playground designer they actually put in play structures to allow for more creativity. In other words, the rules and the practice and the drills we do actually prepare us to be agile and spontaneous in the moment. So structure does the same thing for us in our communication. For example, when I need to think about what it is I want to say, if I can have a very specific structure in mind, it gives me a roadmap, a recipe, if you will, so I know what I'll be saying when I'm going to say it. So let me give you an example. Many people are familiar with this structure. If you've ever watched an advertisement or you've ever pitched an idea, you've probably leveraged some version of this, which is problem, solution, benefit. By first articulating the problem we're trying to solve, then how we go about solving it, and then how we go, how we benefit or how the audience benefits, it makes a clear, compelling, influential pitch, but it also helps me as I'm packaging it because I know I just have to talk about the problem, then the solution, then the benefit. And the really cool thing about this, John, is our brains are wired for structure, for, for story, for something with a beginning, middle, and an end. We do not do well with just lists of information. So leveraging a structure helps actually free you up to be more spontaneous and agile in that moment. A structure, a structure is not a list. That was a line in the book that really got my attention, right? Sometimes you think, oh, I just have to rattle off all these things and, and then I'll be good. And, you know, one of your favorite constructs really spoke to me and kind of was a bit of a slap in the face, unfortunately, uh, given a life journey I had. Uh, 20 something years ago, I was at a wedding in Turkey on the Bosphorus and it was this amazing setup. And a friend, uh, my friend did not ask me at all in advance to do any kind of speaking at his wedding. And he comes up to me right at the moment of the toast and somebody gave one. He said, hey, can you give one too? And honestly, I was so, I, I actually, I chickened out and I'm embarrassed to this day to say that. But you have a really great construct around how to sort of deal with that circumstance. What What is your uh, your structure for for that moment? Yeah. So actually, if you think about it, toasts and tributes are one of the most frequent types of spontaneous speaking that we do. and like any structure, we need to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So I have a, an acronym to help people remember it. It's WHAT, W-H-A-T. The W stands for why are we here? 
Now, in some circumstances, you can skip this step. So for example, if I, we're at a wedding, everybody knows why we're here. The, the couple is, is getting married. But if I'm giving a tribute, let's say we're having a corporate all hands meeting and I'm called upon by the big boss to give a tribute to the team that just launched some product. I might want to say why, why we're all here at this moment. I might want to say we're here to really celebrate the significant advance that this team did to bring this product to market. So sometimes you need to describe why you're there because people don't know. The, the H is how are you connected? So now I'm going to uh, flip the advice. At a wedding, it's important for people to understand who you are and why you're giving the toast. You can say, I've known the groom or the bride for 20 years. Now people understand, oh, that's why that person is speaking. In the corporate world, people generally know your role and position. So I don't have to start my tribute to the team by saying, and I'm the manager of the team because people understand that. So we have flexibility in these structures depending on the context. Why are we here? How are you connected? The A stands for anecdote. Now, all of us listening into this have been victimized by bad toasts where people talk too long, they get too specific, they get too graphic, they make it about themselves and not the people being toasted. So it is incredibly important to have clear, concise, relevant, accessible anecdotes. You tell one or two, and then you get to the T part, which is the thanks and or the toast. So I might just say thank you to the team, or I might raise my glass and toast to the, to the wedding couple. Why are we here? How are you connected? Anecdote or two, and then thanks and toast. If you follow that structure, you will have a clear, concise toast. And, and, and I like everybody to think about, a toast is really a gift that you're giving. The best gifts are packaged nicely, very specific to the person and people involved, and often it is given quickly so the person can enjoy it. So if you follow those steps, a good toast will be given. And come and, and it's a gift, right? And what I also love about the concept you shared on this gift idea is it sort of takes the pressure off you of trying to sort of have this perfect moment and thinking about it's all about you and putting it back to the audience. How can I make this a good circumstance for them, which I just find. And so and that advice rings throughout the book and, and through the work I do. And, and it, the podcast I host, Think Fast, Talk Smart, you can see I'm not very creative with names, but in that podcast as well, all of the guests talk about communication and the key point which you've just made, which is in the book and, and most of the guests on the podcast is it's not about you. It's about the audience. It's about the person or people that you're communicating to. And if you can make that mental shift, not only does it allow you to connect better and deliver better, but it also takes the pressure off of you. Your job is simply to enable, empower, educate others rather than to focus on all the things that you are doing or could be doing or should be doing. So it's a powerful mental shift that's really important. So I, I just love that lesson. And by the way, for those who want to check out Matt's podcast, I just dropped the link in the chat. Uh, it's you. called the Think Fast, Talk Smart podcast from Stanford. I also dropped the link to his book in there, uh, Think Fast, Talk Smarter, top new seller on Amazon today. So excited about that. Uh, you know, and I, this idea of sort of taking the pressure off yourself and, and focusing on the other person makes me think of feedback. Yeah. And you spend a, a fair amount of time in the book talking about feedback and you have a really interesting construct around that, this concept of the four eyes, you know, wh what can we do there and how do those four eyes play a part? Yeah. So feedback is really, really important. And I have lots of thoughts on feedback. Um, and anybody who really wants to learn a lot about feedback, I highly recommend Kim Scott's book, Radical Candor. Kim is a friend, Kim's a neighbor. Uh, and I really, really subscribe to her approach. Uh, very important. When it comes to feedback, I have a few ideas before I'll get you into the structure. One, feedback from my perspective, is an invitation to problem solve. It's not just about me telling you, it's about us together working to fix this issue that I'm bringing up. We also have to think about very clearly what is it we want changed. Many of us are so frustrated that we just want something to be different, but we have to be clear. We have to be concise on what it is we want. I'll give you an example. I have a, a very close friend who was once told he was being intimidating. And the feedback he got was, stop being intimidating. <laughs> That's not very helpful. What does that mean? Rather, had his manager come to him and say, I'd really like for you to wait till everybody else is done speaking and paraphrase what they say before you contribute. That's actionable. That's something that we can actually measure and monitor and work on. So 
We have to first see it as an invitation to problem solve. We have to be very specific and clear on what we want and make sure it's actionable. Third thing we have to think about is what might be leading to this behavior. So imagine you're a manager and you have an employee who continues to show up late and unprepared. Would your feedback be different if you learned that that person was caring for an elder relative who was sick? Probably. You still need the person to be there on time and do their job well, but you might give different feedback than if you suspected the person was just playing video games late in the night or was being lazy. So we need to do some pre-work before we give feedback. And even in the moment, we can quickly ask ourselves those questions. The four eyes approach, again, is just another structure. Four eyes because each of the steps starts with the letter I, and four eyes because glasses sometimes, when you wear them, you're called four eyes, so it helps you see more clearly. The first eye is information. So in that moment, I'm clearly defining what it is I'm giving the feedback on. So I give you the information as objectively as I can. I might say, this is the third meeting that you have now been late for. It's clear, it's objective. Anybody who's been in the meeting looks at their watch, says, yes, that person is late again. The second eye is about impact. And this is the impact that the first eye that you meant information has on you, the giver of the feedback. I might say, I feel or I think you're not prioritizing this meeting to the appropriate level. We use I language, another reason called it's called the four eyes, because when I say I feel, I think, it makes you less defensive. You can't say, no, you don't think that way. I'm just telling you my perspective. So I feel or I think you're not prioritizing this appropriately. The third eye is the invitation. This is where you actually invite the person to problem solve with you. I recommend making this a question. What can we do to help you show up on time? Now, I could make a declarative sentence. If this is the third or fourth time I've had to give this in-the-moment feedback, I might say, I need you to be here five minutes early next time. So that's a declarative statement. And then the fourth I is implications, and these can be positive or negative. They're consequences. If you show up on time to the next meeting, we'll get through this quicker and maybe pick up a new, more engaging project. A negative consequence might be, if you show up late one more time, I might have to remove you from the team. So four eyes, the information, the impact it has on you, the invitation, and then finally the implications. And if you practice this and think this through, not only does it help package the information up in a nice, clear way, it helps you as the person giving feedback prioritize what you want to say. And any good structure does both those things, helps you prioritize, helps your audience understand. I really appreciate this concept of feedback in this collaborative uh, element because so many times, I mean, this number of stories I have in my life of friends and colleagues saying, oh, I just had a feedback session with my manager and, you know, I feel like an idiot now, right? And, and that's kind of where it was left. And I think of my own journey along the way of receiving different feedback. Uh, I, I remember one year I won this big award at my company and it, it, part of my feedback for that year, uh, I had said, I'd made one gaffe at a meeting and said something kind of goofy in front of somebody. And that was all my boss talked about. And I was thinking, I just had a record year here and, and, you know, just me saying three kind of stupid words really derailed this whole thing. And I was starting to wonder if I was getting fired. Uh, so a lot more to it, right. And practice can certainly help yeah, us. And I'm, I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that you had great success that went unrecognized because of a mistake. And, and many of us, many of us fall victim to that. We, we do things that we, we feel badly about, or, or people pick up on, but again, in the book, you know, a lot of what I talk about is mindset. And even in those setbacks, even in those situations, you can see them differently. I like to, rather than talk about mistakes, I like to talk about missed takes. And if you know anything about television or movies, you know that what they do is they will, they will take multiple shots of the same scene. They call them takes. In fact, they bring in that clipboard, clapboard and say, take one, take two. And the whole rationale behind this is not any one take is wrong or bad. It's let's try to see if we can do it differently, maybe make it better, maybe learn something from it. So a missed take is much better than a mistake because all it means is we're just trying it again or we're setting ourselves up for success again. Yeah. Well, think about that. What's the, what percent of films have been made on the first take, right? Or what's the first manuscript that was ever published, right? Right. It's never happened in the history right. of time. Um, you know, if, for those of you who do want to learn more from Matt, by the way, and connect with him, I'm dropping his LinkedIn, uh, his LinkedIn 
uh, profile in the chat there. So uh, Matt invites you to connect with him on there and follow him and, and uh, see what different updates he puts out there on his LinkedIn page. So thank you for that invitation, Matt. Uh, another big theme in the book is about listening. And oftentimes, uh, you know, there's been a few times where I like people have told me I'm a good listener. And I've wondered what that sort of meant over the years. And what I've sort of observed is that, you know, we're not always great listeners throughout our lives. And I'm certainly guilty of that from time to time. But how does being a good listener help you in spontaneous communication? So I could obviously go for the joke and say, I'm sorry, what did you say? But I won't. Uh, Thank so you. Thank you. The, the, the listening is a critical part. So there are six steps in the methodology. We've, we've touched on several of them, but, but the step right in the middle of the methodology, step number four, is all about listening. Once we have our mindset right, once we've begun to address and manage the anxiety we have, we really have to listen to what's needed in the moment. Most of us listen just well enough to get the idea or gist of what somebody is saying. And then we begin practicing, rehearsing. We, we tune out and, and go internal. We need to be vigilant because in the moment, we have to respond and adjust based on what's happening. And I can make mistakes that could be devastating. For example, imagine, John, you and I come out of a meeting and you say, hey, Matt, how do you think that went? And I immediately hear, oh, feedback. That's the gist. And I start itemizing all the things we did wrong, the things you could do better. But had I listened more carefully, I might have noticed you came out the back door of the room, not the front door. You were looking down and were quiet as you asked that question. What you really wanted in that moment, had I really listened, was not feedback, but was support. And by itemizing all the things that we did wrong, that you could have done better, I'm actually doing you a disservice. And maybe causing problems for our future relationship. So I need to listen well. So I have some advice on how to do it. First and foremost, when you're listening, listen for the bottom line. What's the key takeaway? And when you listen for the key takeaway and bottom line, you listen very differently. You listen very intently. So I recommend listening for the bottom line, not just the top level gist. Second, leverage a structure that a colleague of mine, Collins Dobbs, who teaches at the business school with me, he teaches a course on crucial, critical conversations. And he uses a framework to help people do that. And one of the frameworks he uses is very applicable to listening. And I talk about it in the book. It's three things, pace, space, grace. The world comes at us really quickly. It comes at us fast. And we need to slow down to listen well. That might mean setting up a special time to listen. That might mean turning off your phone. Give yourself some time to listen. So we have to slow the pace down. Second, we need to give ourselves a little space. Sometimes it's physical space. We need to move to a place where I can actually hear. But oftentimes it's mental space. I need to make sure that I am dedicating time to be present with you mentally. And then finally, grace has to do with giving yourselves permission, not just to listen to the words, but listen to how the words are be said, being said, the context in which they're being said, and listen also to your internal voice that you hear. So if somebody says something, you might have an intuition or a feeling, give yourself permission to listen to that as well. So by focusing on the bottom line, by giving ourselves a little pace, space, and grace, we can all be better listeners, which means we will be more agile and able to ad adjust and adapt in spontaneous speaking situations. So I love that idea, pay space and grace, but I'm working 80 hours a week, Matt. I've got these demands coming at me every day. I've right. got all these deadlines I've got to meet. How do I create that, pay, that room for pay space and grace, if you will? Well, part of it is practice. Part of it is just practicing to make sure that, that you can do it. And the more you practice it, the more efficient you become. It's also about prioritization. You know, many of us in our communication, we see this, that success is just getting through it, right? So I, I go all over the world teaching people communication skills, helping people with high stakes communications. And I'll often ask, how do you know if you are successful? And the number one response I typically get is, I got through it, as if just getting through the material is the goal. The goal, again, is really about connection. The etymology of the word communication is to make common. In other words, it's to connect with somebody to make what you're saying common with them. And so if we put the priority on that, it drives us to listen more. And it actually often makes us more efficient because a lot of those 80 hours we're spending time is sometimes cleaning up the mess that we made because we did not listen well. We did not package our information up. 
when we were communicating and now we're having to follow up. So I actually think the time spent up front saves us a lot of time on the back end. You know, you talk a little bit about this in the book as well and do this analogy to sports, right? When you see, let's use Lionel Messi who just won the Balloon d'Or, right, the other day. You sure. see him doing these amazing things on the field. It was because he was dribbling around cones, right? And in, in, uh, yeah. at practice hours and hours and hours on end. So when it turns into a moment where he has to be spontaneous, he's so much more prepared for it. So I really appreciate that analogy, especially being a soccer fan. Uh -huh. uh, we're going to wrap up the formal questions here in just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. So if you have questions you'd like to ask Matt, definitely drop them live in the chat and we'll switch to those in just a minute here. And as I said, I've dropped his LinkedIn profile in the chat, his podcast, as well as the Amazon link. And if you haven't gone out and uh, got Matt's book yet, highly recommend it. I just finished it the other day myself and thoroughly enjoyed it. Found some things that, you know, certainly uh, I think I've done okay with over my life. I was certainly a number of lessons I can uh, learn from it. So I really appreciate so many of them, uh, Matt, and just this big perspective shift and thinking about every communication as a way to connect with someone. Because when we connect with someone, that's when we can really drive influence, right? And so how do you try to think about that when this, the, you know, sort of this connection and influence and all these high stakes conversations that you do, like, how do you help people think about that? Well, first and foremost, I think whenever we go into a communication planned or spontaneous, we need to have a goal in mind. And sometimes this goal we can think about weeks in advance and other times it, it's in the moment. I'm opening the door to go into a small talk situation. A goal to me has three parts, information, emotion, and action. So what's the information I want to convey here? Or what's the information I want to learn here, depending on the circumstance? How do I want to help others feel? What do I want them to feel in a certain way? Do I want them excited, concerned, validated? Uh, how do I want to help them feel that way? And then what are the, the actions that I'm looking for as a result? And by focusing on the goal, you can actually help yourself focus on the, what it is you need to do in that moment. Many of us go into these spontaneous situations at a very high level without thinking about the detail. And that pulls us away from that ability to connect. So we have to have a goal. And we also have to think about what's important for the audience. What's most relevant to them? What's salient in their minds in this circumstance? And if we can tie our communication to our goal and what's relevant to them, we're going to be able to connect better and more quickly. And when we make those connections, right, that's what we can we can make the world, we can change the world, right? And connect with others and, and well, the, get things done. I, I am somebody who's always tried to lead my life by, by embracing opportunity. And if you're not connecting, you're not opening up an opportunity. So another big step in this whole process is seeing these situations as opportunistic rather than in threats and challenges. Many of us, when we hear, oh, you're going to get questions at the end of the presentation, or somebody's going to ask you for your feedback, we don't get excited about that. We get actually very defensive and concerned about that. And when you do that, it changes your demeanor. It changes the quality of your responses and it changes the tone that they come with. So if you see opportunity in connecting, in answering questions, in giving feedback, then good things can potentially happen. You'll never know if you don't open yourself up to that. I mean, it's such a, uh, the, like Carol Dweck, the growth mindset, and you're so, uh, it's just so in you. And I so appreciate that. And the other thing I really appreciate about these constructs of constructs are, you know, it's so clear with you and the work you do. And uh, I've seen a number of interviews with you now that, you know, even though you have this structure, uh, dare I say, hiding behind all the things you say, it feels very natural because you mm -hmm. practice it, you rehearse it, and it doesn't feel robotic at all. And, and in fact, it helps you make the point. Uh, I remember many years ago, this is probably a 12 year old story. It was uh, one of the top salespeople at my firm on Wall Street. And we hired a guy from our one of our biggest competitors who were known for being great presenters. And I remember sitting there thinking, well, I'm a successful sales guy. I must be an amazing presenter. And then they had him do a presentation internally. And after he was done, I've, it, I mean, it was like a punch in the face. I was like, I have a lot of work to do. And I went up and grabbed him at the break and said, can we please have lunch? Uh, Jack Golden is his name. If I invited him today, I wonder if he's listening. And uh, I said, Jack, what made your presentation so compelling? And he said, you can have a great story with terrible structure and people say, or a great presentation with terrible structure. And people say, what was that person talking about? And you could have an okay, you know, sort of presentation or content and have fantastic structure. And people walk away thinking that was fantastic because they'll remember what you said, right? I mean, right. Yeah, you absolutely enable them uh, to do that. And I love several things about what you just said there. One, that, that structure is really important, but that you saw an opportunity to improve and you embraced it. One of the things that Carol Dweck and her work on growth mindset, which I uh, adore and think it's a really powerful construct, is this notion of not yet. You know, many of us feel like I'm either born with the ability to communicate well or I'm not. And, and I hope I've disabused people of that. You, we all can get better. 
But when you don't do something to the level that you would like, Rather than saying, I'm never going to get there, say to yourself, not yet. I can get better. You talked to this person. You learned. You worked at it. And you improved. The other thing you said that I think is really important for all of us to think about is the, the comparisons and role models that we use. I love TED Talks. I think TED Talks are really powerful. I've given a few TEDx Talks myself. I've certainly coached a lot of TED speakers. The problem with it is many of us hold our speaking standard up to that quality or level. Or we look at politicians or, or corporate leaders who are really, really good communicators. The problem is all of those folks have been coached. They've all practiced. Some of the talks we witness are actually edited. And when we say that's what good speaking is, that might be good speaking for giving a TED Talk, for leading an organization, for being a politician. But most of our communication isn't that. And when we use that as the standard, that can be very intimidating and can really be restrictive. The goal is connection. It's not to be as good as some of these other people. The goal is to be as best as you can while connecting to the people you're communicating with. So when we change that perspective, it takes a lot of pressure off. So many mindset shifts that you uh, talk about, again, that sort of get us out of this headset, uh, this sort of mindset of, oh, it's, you know, this, the judging ourselves and get beating ourselves up for doing something wrong or trying to be perfect. Uh, and it's such a great way to sort of re-embrace or reframe these things. And I want to just make a couple of quick shout outs because we have people coming in from all over the place. Uh, I see Keisha from Houston, uh, Shannon, Shannon Talbot from Toronto. Hey, Shannon. Uh, Anand, uh, thank you for joining us. Varani, uh, Catherine from Philadelphia, Jean from Bozeman. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, Glenda from Indianapolis, Colorado, Indiana, New Zealand, don't have a name on that one, Illinois, uh, oh, Celine uh, from Bethesda, right down the street here, welcome, uh, great to see you on here, uh, Tucson, Arizona, Virginia, I'm here not far away, very cold, Minnesota, thank you all for joining us, great to see so many folks from all over the place here today. Uh, Matt, one last question I want to ask, and we've got a bunch piling up in the chat here, uh, it feels like there's a through line I'm sensing from your work in the martial arts. This whole idea of you know sort of acting and reacting with this with this person on the other side. Am I am I seeing this correctly, or is, is there a theme there that's played out in your your work? So you know, over over all my years of studying the martial arts, and I like how we started there, and we're coming at least to an end of this portion of the talk back there. There there is a there are a lot of commonalities and parallels. I have often said that that the martial arts have helped me be better as a teacher, as a communicator, as a partner, uh, and and the work I do outside of the martial arts dojo studio uh, helped me be a better martial artist. So there's this notion in the martial arts of responding. There's a difference. We, we, we talk about a difference between reacting and responding. A, re a reaction really literally means to act again, to react. And in that reacting, it can slow you down and it can literally have very painful consequences. Uh, so the goal is to train well enough to become so connected to what you're doing that you just respond and, and it becomes a connection uh, with the opponent, uh, with yourself. So, so there is this notion of practicing, going through movements so that they become so second nature that you just deploy them as needed. And the same is true in spontaneous speaking. And it's really what allows you to connect to people better. That is interesting. So you're you're always learning, you're always growing, always find a way to drive that connection and uh, really appreciate that. Let me put a couple of the questions from the chat that are uh, piling in here. Um, you know, Ryan Allen had a question here. Uh, I don't know, hopefully you can read that. I can put it out. Uh, cold calling, something all of us face, especially in sales. Sometimes it's a conversation with the phone or in person. Other times it's initial email. Does your book address this and the concept? And if so, what's an example? Yeah, so I, I call out cold calling as an example of where most of us feel uh, high pressure, be it in sales, be it a student, be it, be it in a, a meeting and the boss turns to you and says, what do you think? Uh, the, the idea there, first and foremost, is to give yourself a little bit of time. We feel this pressure to respond immediately, as if responding immediately demonstrates our competence and, and our confidence. It's okay to take a pause. You can literally just not say anything, or you can say, let me think about that. Or you can ask a, a clarifying question, or I'm a huge fan of paraphrasing, where you highlight or extract something of value that the person has said before you answer. All of these buy yourself a little bit of time because with those few moments, you can begin to pull in a structure to answer the question. You can begin to prioritize what's most important here. So giving yourself a little space can actually help you get through those circumstances. And then by being well-versed in different structures, and the whole second part of my book has 
structures for very specific situations. We talked about toasts, we talked about feedback, but there's small talk, there's trying to be persuasive and pitching, which fits into Ryan's question. That's when you invoke those structures, but first you have to get yourself grounded and give yourself a little bit of time. Very nice, thank you for that question, uh, Mr. Allen, uh, thank you. Um, another one in here from uh, Shavika Singh from Montclair State University, president of the Economic Society. Thank you for joining us, Shavika. Uh, what do you think the importance of eye contact is in spontaneous communication? What have you, uh, what if you have to look away to gather your thoughts? I really like this question uh, because it, it reminds us that, that communicating is not just about what we say. It's about how we say it. Many of us, because of our anxiety, we retreat, we make ourselves small, we look away and that all signals our lack of confidence. So there are things we can do to appear confident, even if we don't feel as confident. We open up our bodies. We square up to the person. We don't turn away or look down. We make good eye contact as we are being asked and then as we respond. Now, it is normal in everyday conversation to look away. We don't stare at people when we talk. When you look away, if you can train yourself to look down rather than looking up, you actually do yourself a, a service. When people look up, we look confused. We look disengaged. We might even look disingenuous. When you look down, you look more pensive and thoughtful. So it's normal and natural to look away. The human face is the most complex thing that our brain processes information from. And if we're looking at a human face and trying to think, it can be really challenging. So looking down makes sense. If you're standing in front of a room, for example, and somebody asks you a question, as you begin to answer the question, you might want to move to the other side of the room. It's natural to look down as you walk. It gives you an excuse to look away. If you're in a meeting, I always have a notebook in front of me. And if somebody asks me a challenging question or I have to just collect my thoughts before I respond spontaneously, I just look down at the notebook. Often there's nothing even written on the page, but it gives me a reason to look down rather than looking up. So thank you for the question because it really does remind us that nonverbal presence, what we do with our body and voice, matters a lot in all communication, including spontaneous communication. Creating that space that you talked about earlier, right? To yeah. find that answer. Love that. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions and I've got one I'm gonna throw up here, but if anyone has another one or two, please throw them in the chat. Happy to get to those. I'm gonna paraphrase this one because it's it's a little bit long here, but Jen is basically asking, you know, how does this how does this work in a can some of these lessons apply in a family dynamic or does it feel like they're getting your family getting taught at home or coached at home? <laughs> Well, so I, I am still experimenting with that. Uh, I have I have two teenage kids. Uh, I have a, a loving wife, and and I try to put these into practice. I am constantly reminded by my two teenage sons that I still need some work on my communication. Uh, and when I ever I talk about listening, I can see my wife looking at me like you need you need a little more practice there. But uh, yes, no, I believe these communication skills transcend business. I mean, uh, most of our communication in our professional and personal lives is spontaneous. And these techniques, these mindsets can really help. I personally have benefited this in challenging situations and conversations I've had with friends. I've benefited from this in the conversations I've had to have with my parents and my kids. So th these absolutely play out. How high you turn the volume up on some of these, that depends uh, on the circumstance and situation, but that's true in the business world as well. Uh, thank you for that. I want to jump over to the rapid fire questions here now and, and sure. get wrapped up here. But these are these are a lot of fun. So these are just quick answers here. But uh, and, yeah, and, we'll, and John, we'll... I'm happy if people connect on LinkedIn, I'm happy to continue the conversation. They can send me questions and I'm happy to answer. I, if, if I have value to provide, I'm happy to try. Thank you so much. I, I did drop his uh, Matt's link in the chat. I'll do it one more time just in, so we have it sort of uh, in the chat, if you will. There it is. Uh, so Matt, favorite thing to cook? Ah, so I I have a big sweet tooth. And so banana bread is my favorite thing to make. I have a I have a secret. What I do is that I replace some of the oil or the, the fat and the butter. Uh, I actually get pureed baby food, banana baby food, put it in. It is awesome because it it fulfills the purpose of the oil and the fat and it adds <laughs> extra banana taste. So there you go. You didn't know you were going to get a cooking lesson, but I love making banana bread and I have a secret ingredient. Shout out to Gerber, is it? Is it yeah, right? exactly, exactly. Uh, exactly. First concert you went to? Oh, now I'm dating myself. So the first <laughs> concert, uh, I I loved uh, the band Genesis. And the first concert nice. I ever saw was Genesis. Those who are of my vintage will remember Phil Collins and gang. Actually, 
Uh, it was just when Phil Collins took over because Peter Gabriel used to be their lead singer. So those of you who know what I'm talking about, rock on. For those of you who don't, go check it out on Spotify. I, I saw Phil Collins live at uh, Camp Randall at University of Wisconsin when I was in school. Uh, yeah. I love it. Uh, last photo on your phone. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a great question. So we have been having some pretty cool sunsets where I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. The, the most recent photo I have is one my wife and I love to walk and we were out walking and there was a beautiful sunset I took a picture of. Nice. Mine is my uh, son's Halloween parade yesterday at school. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, my, my teenagers uh, did not do the Halloween thing. Otherwise, that's what I would have done. Most audacious goal for the book. So I get the, I have been asked, what does success look like? And people are like, do you want to be on a bestseller? No, my audacious goal for this book, I want this book to be underlined, dog-eared, highlighted, returned to as needed. I, I think success uh, for me is helping people communicate more confidently and comfortably. And so my audacious goal is that people will use this book to help them achieve their communication goals. And I would love it if this book looked worn. I, I have several books that if you looked at them, they're all worn. And, and, and that to me is what success is. A book is something not just to learn from, but something to use. And if some, if people use my book in that way, I will feel hugely successful. Want to get some mileage out of the book for each yeah, listener. Exactly. I love it. Sticky notes, highlighters. Let's do it, people. Uh, Matt, if you could, uh, what is one thing that sort of uh, uh, you learned as you wrote the book or maybe surprised you along the way? So I, I learned so much. Yeah, no, I learned so much in writing this book. Uh, you know, I, I hope it adds value to people. It's certainly the process added value to myself to me in, in, in the things that I do and the things that I try to help others with. Perhaps the single most important thing that I learned uh, in the whole process is that it really does take time to develop these skills. Uh, and it, because all, I'm a huge fan of rapid prototyping. So everything I did, I was testing with people and I, and I saw that it takes time, but with persistence, you can improve. Uh, I had in the back of the book and the acknowledgements, there's a long list of people I acknowledge because they actually helped me be able, by trying out these different steps. I had done it in, in teaching and, and I feel I have it down pretty well in workshops and classes I teach and the coaching I do. But in a written form, I really wanted to see if it would translate. And and what I came away with an appreciation of is it takes time. It takes three things, repetition, reflection and feedback. And if you do those three things, you take the time to get the practice, you reflect on what's working, what's not working, and you get feedback from others, you can get better at this communication. So I really came away with that appreciation and, and hopefully made the adjustments in the book to really help people achieve that goal. I love that. You can practice, you can practice, be spontaneous. You've You've proven it. And uh, Matt's book, by the way, is filled. Each chapter, each sort of major segment he talks about has a actual little uh, uh, a way to practice what he preaches right there in the book which i really appreciate that i call it try this and drill this i think it, 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 it the book the books i enjoy the most are the books that i i really engage with that tell me give me advice and guidance and i go do them and that's what i tried to build into this and they're and they're sort of bite-sized exercises which i really appreciated uh matt if you would describe your writing journey of think faster talk smarter in five words i love being put on the spot like this <laughs> learning loving, leveraging, liking, and I'm running out of L's. So I'm going to just say, <laughs> I'm just going to say, um, gratitude. Love it. Gratitude. So, so the, the, those are the ingredients that went into, to it, both for me personally and for the people that helped me do it. Incredible book, incredible story. Uh, Matt, any closing thoughts for our listeners here? First, thank you to you, John, and thank you to everybody who's listened. I encourage all of you to take the journey to be a better communicator. I am on that journey myself. If I can help, let me know. The LinkedIn, the, the Think Fast, Talk Smart podcast, all of us can get better at our communication and all of us can help connect and really share important ideas and beliefs and feelings that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for being a guest here. Thanks to all our listeners for joining us and being on this episode of Meet the Author Live. Go out and get a copy of Matt's book. Uh, anywhere you can find books out there, you'll find a copy of Think Faster, Talk Smarter, and connect with him on LinkedIn to learn more. Really appreciate everyone joining in today. Please follow me on LinkedIn as well, JCS Optimizer, to look for future episodes coming up. Thanks again for joining us. I'm your host, John Saunders. Keep moving forward.